Yeah. He really, really, really interested to have an understanding of God's will for you and how prosperity can be very, very much part of your life. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says that you lived in poverty for so long that you don't know what prosperity looks like. Are you aware of that? Now, we're going to go into some very TV, serious teaching about money. As I said, the message out yesterday. Some people read it and they just ignored it. You must do everything in your power to be here at every sense. You understand? We understand it's holiday time and all right now. One thing I do not do, whether it's holiday time or whatever, I never dial down. If anything, I actually stir myself up even more. So everybody is going into holiday mode, I go into Holy Ghost fire mode. You understand? And I want you to do the same. Because I'm so interested in you getting where God wants you to be. I can't, if I go, I'll be going on my own if you don't come with me. So you can't sit back on your lazy boy chair and think that I can take you along with me. You've got to be here with me. You've got to do your part. Are you listening? Because this is your life of faith. And there are so many promises in the word about what God can do and what He has already done for you and he want, what He wants to do for you. But your ignorance is not going to help you. So you've got to get the knowledge. And that comes by studying God's Word and by the help of the Holy Spirit. So now, I'm just going to cover something today. I need to do this it's more of a foundational kind of a, uh, a session to help you prepare for what's going to happen hereafter. Are you listening? So I'm going to teach about prosperity. I'm going to teach about money like I've never spoken about money before. Because somehow I realize this, that it's not that God has not done anything for us. I mean, many Christians live like that, right? They live as if God did nothing for them. As if Jesus did nothing for them. All, it's not because they choose to be that way. They can't help themselves because they are ignorant of the truth. They're ignorant of their privileges. So we've got to dig in and get to understanding what are the privileges. Because knowledge is power, you understand? It is power. You've got to use it. It is, it is static power. That means only in the movement of this knowledge will that power be released. You can't just think it or have it in your mind and just sit there. You've got to use it. It's static power. Unless you use the knowledge you have, it cannot even benefit you. Are you listening? It comes with movement. The power is released through movement. So knowledge is power and knowledge comes from the Holy Spirit. He's the one who gives us understanding. I don't know what we'll do without Him, really. Because there is nothing that we can figure out on our own when it comes from Scripture. You see, He wrote this book. So He's the best one to consult when you're studying this book. Because then He can give you understanding and He can give you revelation upon revelation. And as long as you allow Him, He will educate you and you will start this beautiful journey. Your life will never be the same again as long as you are here still on this earth. I can guarantee you that because that is His word. And listen, there's a scripture in the Bible in Jeremiah, first chapter. I think it's verse 12. God asked Jeremiah, Jeremiah was still a very young man, just getting into ministry. And the Holy Spirit was busy ministering to him. So, in the very first chapter of the book, verse 12, I think, God asked him, Jeremiah, what do you see? What do you see, Jeremiah? So in this vision, as Jeremiah was sitting there, he was saying to the Lord, Okay, this is what I see. I see a branch of an almond tree. And God said to him, Mm-hmm, you've seen accurately. 
you've seen you've seen accurate that is a branch of an amun tree because you have seen accurately this is not going to tell in jeremiah because you have seen accurately i'm going to quicken my word i'm going to hasten my word there's a lot, lot of uh, there's one root word there for that but there's a lot of you know offshoots i'm going to quicken my word i'm going to hasten my word i'm going to watch over my word to bring this to pass in your life you know why because you've seen accurately now you know there are a lot of people don't see accurately especially when it comes to poverty and prosperity listen church i'm going to help you by the power of the holy spirit to help you to see because this is my understanding unless you see it you can't have it so in other words that word see is not just looking at it but understanding it now you know it's 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 a beautiful verse of scripture because there's so much to it do you know a almond tree takes 20 years to bear if you plant an almond tree it will take 20 years to bear fruit so very appropriately god said to jeremiah because you have seen it i'm sending my word i'm hastening my word so in other words i'm going to the thing that takes 20 years to grow is going to produce now why because jeremiah saw it let me ask you a question what do you see poverty what your parents taught you what your boss is telling you what the government is saying those are the things that you are seeing you watching the news report and, and television reading it in newspapers and magazines that is all you are seeing what people are messages they are sending out in the group chats that's all you are seeing they not healthy most of them but when you start to see accurately how will hasten my word how will quicken my word to bring it to pass so in other words there will be no time delay are you listening yesterday you was in poverty today you in prosperity how many of you want a quick transition Well, you have about three of you, four of you on this room. The rest of you are fine. You are very wealthy people, very prosperous people. But you see, there are keys, church. We got to use them. And one of the key here is in this verse of scripture. Very, very misunderstood. Very, very misunderstood scripture. Very misunderstood verse. Very, very much misunderstood. This is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. All right? Now, let me ask you a question. Do you have the capacity to seek the kingdom or to seek his righteousness? All right, just say you do have the capacity. Can you define the capacity to me? Please listen to me carefully, okay? It's important. I'm going to try and educate you the best I can. But you've got to have to hear me. You can't be distracted. Listen. So let's ask this again. Just say you have the capacity to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How will you define that capacity to me? Capacity to me. How can you tell me what it is? Well, I can give you my definition. My definition of my capacity is my faith. In who? In the righteousness of God, who is Jesus Christ himself, and in the kingdom of God, who is Jesus Christ himself personified here on the earth. That day when he was standing in front of the Jews, when he was saying to them seek first the kingdom of God, he was actually pointing to himself. 
Seek his righteousness. He was pointing to himself. Are you listening? So he's saying to the people, don't do what the pagans do. Don't do what the Gentiles do. Don't do what the other people do. They run after these things. But what you do, you seek me. How difficult is that? How difficult is that? You seek me. I have come to establish the kingdom of God here on the earth. And I am the righteousness of God. No wonder the scripture says that we are all, those that believe in him, we are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. How did you find that righteousness? Do you, did, did you do anything to receive that? How did you seek it? Obviously, if you did, you did it by faith. You didn't achieve your righteousness. All you did was you accepted it. Because he gave you his righteousness and took away all your unrighteousness. And nailed it to the cross. Took it to the tomb and left it in the grave. Now you are the righteousness of God in him. Are you listening? So the key here is first and foremost for you to understand that we have a king. And he's a righteous king. And this king has taken responsibility over me. I know some of you, you don't give the king a little chance to take responsibility over you because you're your own God. You know what to do next. Even though the scripture says, make all your plans known unto God so that they will succeed, you don't make your plans known to God, you just know what to do. How many of you got your tomorrow already planned out? And the next day, and the next day, you live like you don't need God. Because you're so organized. You actually organized yourself out of the plan of God. Because you like your self-sufficient. You know what the meaning of the word God is? All-sufficient one. So when you start making yourself self-sufficient, then to yourself you're an all-sufficient one. My money, my job, my house, my this, my that, my future. You, you're like you're all, all on your own. You are God to yourself. That is where many poor people, people who live in poverty, this is where they have gone off. Are you listening? So what was he saying? What's the, the main part? What's the core of this message in this verse of scripture? Don't run after those things. Look to me. When you start looking to me, because I'm that kingdom of God manifested, I'm the righteousness of God manifested, and all these things that other people run for will just be added to you. Where it all starts? In the mind. Prosperity is not just money. Prosperity is the condition of your mind. Poor people sometimes get a lot of money, but they're still poor because of their mind. And notice because of the mind they have, the money don't stay too long. So where's the problem? Is in not adding enough? Where is the problem in the mind? It's in the mind. So this is the foundation of this whole journey we are starting out on. What's the foundation? Jesus Christ is my righteousness. Now I am the righteous, righteousness of God in Him. I am a citizen of this kingdom and I am a king that loves me. He is taking the responsibility over me. I'm not my God on my own. He is my God. He is my Lord. He is my all-sufficient one. It's the responsibility of my king to provide for me. Are you listening? So let's get that into place right now. Get that into place in your life. How do you do this? Meditate. If you listen to Wednesday's message, I was talking on meditation. You start to meditate. What are you meditating on? What someone did to you? What someone said to you? How they gossiped about you? I know some of you, you spend most of your time thinking about those things. 
And they're not paying you anything. They're bringing no dividends to you. They're just stressing you out. So what are you meditating on? I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. I am a citizen of this kingdom and my king loves me. That's how you put in that foundation. You meditate on this. You understand? Because this is lovely. This is pure. This is beneficial. This is virtuous. This is honorable. When you start thinking like this, I have a king who loves me to the point that he gave his life for me. I'm a citizen of this kingdom. And you know what? I have his righteousness in me. Isn't that a wonderful thing to meditate on? So let's get that in. Get that, that, make that part of your foundation. Just let's jump over quickly to Luke 17. From verse 20. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not, does not come with observation. Right? Does not come with observation. Verse 21. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is where? The kingdom of God is where? Within you. Within you. Now listen, this was news to the Jews. It's the first time they're hearing this. Before this, they were in the kingdom, but the kingdom was not in them. So this is the first time even the Jews were hearing this, that the kingdom of God, because the Jews asked him a question, when will the kingdom of God come? They were looking at a kingdom, you know, a physical kingdom. They were looking at Israel becoming a kingdom again. That's the question. That was their question. But they related to the kingdom of Israel as the kingdom of God. They didn't know there was a change coming. Israel on its own will not be the kingdom of God as it was in the old covenant. There's a new kingdom of God that is being established. And that kingdom will be made up of every nationality in the world. So this was news for them. And he said this. That kingdom of God is not going to come through observation. That means nobody will see it. Oh, yes, it's coming. Or oh, there it's coming. No, no, no. The kingdom of God is within you. Verse 22. Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. I mean, uh, this is sad, right? This is sad. Because these were not just every Jew now. This was the disciples. This was the disciples he was talking to. He says, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. And you will not see it. Okay, it's, I think mostly based on the people's attitude. The Jewish nation is a very, very prideful nation. You understand? They, they dwell more in, on, on what happened to them in history than what's happening now. And their history is keeping them in, to this, in this bondage of pride. Okay, we don't want to spend too much time on that. Verse 23. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. Okay, because what man was, would try to do is establish his own kingdom. Verse 24. For as the lightning that flashes out of, the, out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in His day. Now, there are some things at that point in time that was happening in Israel. The people, uh, the Jews, were busy praying to God to fulfill uh, the prophecies that God gave to them you know, before that, there's so many prophecies. They were busy seeking God and asking Him to fulfill those prophecies. Jesus, when He came to the earth, He came as a fulfillment of those prophecies.
But he came to demonstrate the kingdom of God. He came to lead these people from where they were to where God wants them to be. But their pride didn't allow it. For the exception, there were some of them, like the disciples, that really bought into the vision that Jesus came with. And that's how they became his disciples. So, Jesus gave, gives an example here. He says, for as the lightning that crashes out of one part under heaven and shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Now, the knowledge of him, the Bible says, covers the earth as the water covers the sea. That was a prophetic word given by an old covenant prophet. And we see that prophecy is coming to pass. You understand? The only thing that keeps Jesus from coming back to the earth is that the gospel message must reach the ear of every person. That's the only thing that will keep him in heaven. Only after every single person, every single human being on the earth has heard the gospel message, and has made a decision, a decision either to accept the gospel or to reject it. But they must hear it. Are you listening? So, that one thing we know, that is fast developing. But then again, this was about his second coming. You understand? Now many people believe that Jesus will be coming and they're going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. That Jesus is coming to sit inside the temple. I'll say it. The Lord of all glory. He's not looking for some kind of building. You understand? He's going to come like a lightning. And when he comes, everybody is going to know that he's coming. So you and I are already a part of this old operation here. Of God's old affair on the earth. Every single one of you play a part. Now when it comes to prosperity again, you've got to have this understanding. You're not like a poor little me, somebody or something in one corner somewhere. You play a vital role in the kingdom of God. Not just for you to pay your bills, you understand? And have enough food. It's much more than that. So we need, we need to just get going and getting deeper and deeper, we'll get there. So now, let's go to, the, to chapter 6 of the same book. Just one verse of scripture here. Now, there are many people in the world... get saved. They come to salvation by believing in Jesus Christ. Right? People are different. Some people when they come here, they come in with a, a total different mindset. They come in with great understanding that they are sinners and they need salvation. So they come to Jesus they receive Him as the Lord, they, they, they confess Him, they go through water baptism, they go through Holy Spirit baptism and all of that, and then they continue living for the Lord. But a lot of them do that with, the, with full of spirit, you understand? Some of them are here and there, but this is one group of people Jesus mentioned here. I want you to understand this. He says, then He lifted up his eyes towards his disciples and said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now that translation, there's something missing there. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Right? For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That is exactly what the original Greek says. Blessed are the poor in spirit in spirit not talking about poor in the Holy Spirit talking about the poor in their own spirit so in other words what that really means is that when you meet someone who's an extrovert they can't stop talking right have you spoken to an extrovert and double trouble is when you meet when you talk to an extrovert that is full of spirit Oh, that's double trouble. Because then they know about everything. <laughs> and they can never stop talking. Have you met that kind of person? Every question you ask, they got an answer. You, you understand? So in other words, they, they come with this full of spirit. 
that they would that they will just take control over that uh, over that situation. You understand? There could be five people in that company, but this one person is really dominating it. That company, because of him or her being full of spirit, they can't shut their mouth. And they know about everything about everything. Have you met a person like that? Now, this is the other group that Jesus is talking about. The people that already know they are good for nothing. Poor in spirit. No confidence whatsoever in themselves. People that come to God who know how desperate they are for Him. Have you met that kind of people? I don't know. But there's so many of them around. And he singled them out. He says, blessed are those, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. So in other words, your condition is saying to you that you really need God. You really need God. Some people come in full of spirit. Some people come in just, you know, like mediocre. Some people come in down and out. Drained out, frustrated, poor, miserable, blind, naked, hungry. They come in that state. Those are the ones he's talking about. He says, blessed are you are you those that are poor in spirit? What's the second part? He says, for yours is the kingdom of God. Man, you talk about hope. To the hopeless. You talk about blind, uh, rather sight to those that are blind. You talk about healing to those that are sick. You talk about food to those that are hungry. It's all here. What did he say to them? Is he saying to them, don't worry, I will provide for you? No, no, no. He's saying to them, the whole kingdom is yours. So my, my, my big argument here about this whole thing, no, not with him, with you. How come he said the whole kingdom is yours? But you're just happy with what you have. And it's nothing in comparison to what the kingdom has. You see, our minds have been conditioned to accept what our circumstances dictate, to accept what our parents taught us. You understand? They taught us, you know, don't do this and don't do that, and you know, everything that we that we need to uh, that we use in life. To a poverty mind, it's wastage. You understand? So even if you need to, to, to get something that you're so desperately, desperately in need of, guess what you're going to look for first? And what is the price? Now that's not prosperity. That's poverty, full-blown. How are you listening? But when you are indoctrinated with kingdom theology, that's not the first thing. The first thing is that, Lord, this is what I need and this is what I ask you for. And you said in your word, I must believe that I receive it and I will have it. And now I thank you, Lord, for it. That's kingdom. Because you're not looking at how much money you got in your bank account. You're not looking at how much, of, how much you're earning. You're not waiting for your next increase. Can you see how you can be your own God? How you are making a plan for yourself? All that has to go. I don't know whether you're going to give them, give them up or not. But I've got to have to ask you to let them go. Are you listening? God provides you with things for you to use. Have you ever met somebody the moment you open the tap, they ask you why you're wasting water? I'm just using a simple example. You're not wasting, you're using water. That is what it's there for. To use it. That's why God's providing it. That's why He's providing it to you. 
So every time you open the tap, you're not wasting water, you're using water. But a poverty mind will tell you you're wasting water. So what should I do? Not wash my hands? So I could save water while it is provided by God for me to use it? You understand? You go to the shop to buy something. You go and look for the cheapest one. That's poverty again. That's poverty. So what I am saying to you right now, I'm just trying to help you here. If the kingdom of God is yours, as Jesus is saying, you're going to have to let that kingdom of God in you rise up in you. So in other words, you've got to let this indoctrinate your mind. You've got to let the kingdom mentality rule. You've got to see yourself as God sees you. Maybe it'll help you stand in front of the mirror at home and talk to yourself. Some of you, maybe you need to do that. Talk to yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, I am a child of God. I am blessed. I am privileged. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is my king. And money, you are my servant. And you will come to me. I know for some of you, it sound, this sounds like, hey, what kind of message is this? I never heard this before. Yeah, you're in for more shock. I don't know whether you're going to get shock treatment or shock therapy or what, I don't know. But I'm going to have to try and shock you to reality. Because you're suffering in your life because of the way you think, the way you operate, how you, what your mind is saying, and all of that is all error. We're going to look at this deeper as we're going. Okay, let's go to Romans chapter 4, verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead, and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. It's important for you to take note of this verse of scripture. We're coming back to that verse. We dealt with it, but we're coming back to it because it all starts with the way you think and what comes out of your mouth. You know, one of the bad things for people to do is always complaining. Complain, 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 complain. Never happy about anything. Never come to a point of being satisfied. You know, the song is such a beautiful song. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you've been so, so good. With every breath I am able. My God. Do you know, we, some Christians never come. Okay, a man, when you sing it in church, they sing it. Because it's good music, you see. But it's not a reality to them. Why? Because they're so ungrateful. Where is that root of ingratitude coming from? Our upbringing? Maybe. The way our parents lived? The way our elders lived? Where is this ingratitude coming from? I mean, to some people, it's very deeply rooted. They can never see anything good, even if it's right in front of them. They find everything wrong with everything. Never at a point of satisfaction. I'm telling you this, church, this is such an important part of getting this faith life developed in our lives, is to have an attitude of gratitude. Be thankful. You know what Paul the Apostle said? He says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That you give thanks in all things. Not for all things. In all things. To some of you, I know this is like fresh news. Breaking news, right? Yes. 
How about taking a, some time off and taking a deep breath and raise your hands to Him and say, Oh Lord, I thank You for this beautiful oxygen. I thank You for this beautiful wind that is blowing outside. And some people are so grumpy. Man, and so miserable. They make the whole environment around them the, where they are miserable. That's no gratitude to God. You see, when you start living in this way, when you start calling those things that be not, when you're calling them into existence, you follow up on what you say. So in other words, you change your mentality, you change your vocabulary, even when things look bleak, you don't talk about it being bleak. You go by what the Word of God is saying. So in other words, you're calling that thing into existence. What are you calling? Demons? I don't know. It's up to you. Many people invite demons to their houses. Many. They've got many ways. I mean, talk about Christian people now. I hope you watched that video that was posted on the chat about Christmas. It's reality. It's true. Christmas is demonic. It's demonic. It's full-blown demonic. But the church so struggles to come to terms with us. Why? Because it's traditional. But when you go back into history and see where it's coming from, it's got nothing to do with Jesus. Do you think I want to be a dummy church? Do you think I want to be a dummy? I don't want to. I'm a sucker for knowledge. I love knowledge. I will, you know, if I get a chance to watch something, even on TV or whatever, I want knowledge. I am hungry for knowledge 24 hours a day. If I can read something and learn something, I would do that. I'm not a dummy. I don't want to be a dummy. So I have studied about Christmas many years ago, decades ago. And came to know that this is not of God. But who would hear me? Not many. Not many. I mean, if I cel we celebrate Christmas here, yeah, this room will be full. But who wants to know the truth? Not many. No, we just want to go with the trend. We just want to go with the trend and what, what's going on. Do you know history teaches this, and which is true, from the time that, from the time of Easter, right up until the time of the 25th of December, do you know that's the most evil time in the pagan world? History teaches that women used to get pregnant during the time of Easter to give birth so they can sacrifice their babies in the time of December 21st. Were you aware of that? So you think we want to walk around like a bunch of dummies here? When we know the truth? And Jesus said, if you know the truth, it will set you free. How many Christians are free? I mean, it's a shame what happens on television with all those well-known preachers in the world. Christmas this, Christmas that, Christmas this, Christmas that. Even though the truth is right in front of them, and they will still propagate Christmas. Can you see the depth of bondage? I'm coming back to this. If you're calling those things that be not, just as though it is, it's like, Lord, in 2023, <laughs> I will have so much of money, I would know what to do with it, and I'm just going to do good works with it. People look at you and say, but yeah, but you, you know, uh, you still got the same job, you know, you're still earning so much. None of your business. I am calling those things that be not just as though it is. 2023, I'm going to do good works. I'm going to attach myself to my pastor. Whatever he does, I'm going to do it together with him. No, but I won't have enough. I won't afford that. That's what you are speaking. But you can change that. 
You can say, Lord, 2023, I will have so much of money. I'm going to be involved in changing lives and finding destiny. But you, you see, listen, listen very carefully. You don't need no qualification for that. Because you're already in the kingdom. And the kingdom is yours. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. He said the kingdom is yours. So what am I speaking now? Kingdom language. Don't count the cost of what you have. Rather, call it into existence. Are you listening? So right now, just got about maybe two weeks or so before this year is over, you can start preparing your mind for action in 2023. I'm talking about real financial action. Are you listening? So this is how you call things. You don't need no proof. You don't need no evidence because faith is the evidence. You understand? Faith is the substance. Are you listening? It's the matter that brings things together. Faith is the evidence. If other people are looking for the evidence in you. They might not find what they're looking for. But if they're looking for faith, that's what they will find. So now, you can use your faith like a tool. Are you listening? You can use it like a tool. You know, when you take a, a nail clipper in your hands to cut your nails, how you use it? Are you listening? If you take a knife and a fork and you sit down to eat, how will you use it? Those are tools. In the same way you can use your faith. And faith starts with the words that comes out of your mouth. If you call, keep calling your children dummies, and when they become dummies, you have yourself to blame. You understand? If you keep calling them stupids, and when they do stupid things, you are to blame. When you keep telling them they will amount to nothing, and when they don't amount to anything, you are to be blamed. Stop saying, I don't know what kind of children this is. No, no. They are kind. They are the kind that you have reared. You raised them up. They are your kind of children. Hey, I wish my children was like pastor's children. I've heard people tell me this. Well, then you must bring them up like our pastor brought them up. Are you listening? You can't be living one way and doing what you want. Pay no attention to them. You can't do that. Huh? You're living a confused, filthy life. You want them to live a decent, godly life? When will that happen? How will that happen? If you change the way you walk, they'll change the way they walk. Man, if you are a person that loves Jesus, and your love for Jesus has become evident to your children, they will become lovers of Jesus. I mean, even little babies. A little while ago, Haley was fast asleep. So when she got up, her mom brought her and put her there in the lounge to sit. So I came to her and said, baby, you had a dream. Was you, were you dreaming about Dada? She said, Jesus. I said, yeah, I would love to know that dream, baby. She had a dream about Jesus. That's the first thing that came out of her mouth. Now, you don't tell me the child is too small to know that. She's getting Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all the time. When she's with us in our house, she's getting Jesus all the time. When she's at her home with her parents, she's getting Jesus all the time. When she comes here to church, she's getting Jesus all the time. She's a Jesus baby. She's a Jesus girl. That's what you do. So what are you doing? You're building not just your future, but their future. How many of you would love a peaceful life with your children when you turn 60? 
You can go to bed at night, raise your hands to him, say, Thank you, Father, for my blessed children. Thank you tonight, Father. And go and have a good night's sleep. You want that? Go to start working now. You understand? You got to start working now. You get your life right, you start speaking over the lives of children, you're not blessed. You're not blessed, children. You're not blessed. You're not the best children in the world. Y'all will serve Jesus. You're a, you're a Jesus boy. You're a Jesus girl. That's what I've been telling these kids they're from little, little children. I say that to the other children right now. I say that to Samuel often. You're a Jesus boy. Why? I'm making him Jesus conscious. I'm giving, a, giving him a Jesus conscience. Are you listening? Now you want to know why these children are so responsive to Jesus. Because they're hearing about him all the time. Now she was sitting and listening to this one song. You know, Yes, Jesus Loves Me on television. She was sitting there in the lounge. And she was really engrossed watching this thing. And I was watching her as she was watching this song. She heard this song before. But you know what caught her attention in that song? With a big smile, she turned at me and said, me, See Jesus. I said, Yes, really. <laughs> Nothing else caught her here but Jesus, the name Jesus. What am I saying to you? How is that happening by magic? No, someone's putting the effort in. So in other words, I'm calling things that be not just as though it is. You know what I'm praying for her now? I'm praying, Lord, she will be a carrier of your glory to her generation. See, we're not playing around with this. This is lives. We are messing around with this. We've got no time for anything else. We've got time to live what the kingdom is teaching us. Jesus said the kingdom is mine. Jesus said the kingdom is yours. So what am I doing? I'm speaking it into existence. Money, you're my servant. Jesus is my Lord. 